From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. On today's show, we're going to be hearing from a woman who brought her sheep ranch back from the brink to create a successful and regenerative wool business. That's right after these quick messages. This program is sponsored by the Agrarian Trust. Agrarian Trust is charting a new path forward for the land trust movement. They're advancing an innovative and robust model of land ownership in which agrarianism, social and environmental justice, community well-being, and the earth itself are all seen as fundamentally intertwined. They're doing this by helping regenerative farmers and ranchers to secure long-term affordable leases. That helps to strengthen local food systems and to transform community relationships to the land across the country. Visit agrariantrust.org to learn more. This program is sponsored by the Greenhorns. Listeners to Down to Earth might enjoy the newly released sixth edition of the New Farmer's Almanac, a literary miscellany written by and for working agrarians. This year's volume is titled Adjustments and Accommodations, and it's full of essays, poetry, and images that explore how people are facing challenges and uncertainties on the land. Learn more and order your copy at greenhorns.org. Kivira Coalition's new agrarian program opens applications for 2024 apprentices from November 1st through December 15th. This eight-month full-time apprenticeship program helps beginning agrarians gain mentorship and work experience in regenerative ranching and farming at mentor operations in New Mexico, Colorado, and Montana. For more information, visit our website at kiviracoalition.org slash newagrarian And visit Kivira's events tab to register for the next NAP 101 call where we describe our participating mentor sites in detail and answer questions from prospective apprentices. Hope to see you there. Kivira is spelled Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. Once again, kiviracoalition.org slash new agrarian. And now to our program. I'd like now to welcome Jeannie Carver. She's founder and president of Shanico Wool Company in Maupin, Oregon. Welcome to Down to Earth. Well, thank you. So you're from a ranching family that goes back over 150 years. Tell us about the history of your family ranch. Oh, yes, it is a rich history. One of one of the great American stories that there are many of here in the western U.S. The story of this ranch really starts on the Oregon Trail in 1852 when a young man was born in an ox cart as his family came west with the hope of farming. And so he grew up in western Oregon in the Willamette Valley, which is lots of rain, very fertile. You can grow anything. And he grew up there seeing the land get farmed and fenced and overcrowded. So when he became 19 years old, he really wanted to be a stockman, not a farmer. So with the promise of land with the Homestead Act, he took off on his own and went over the Cascade Mountains east into Oregon's interior high desert country. And he filed on a 160 acre homestead claim that was 1871. He brought in sheep and cattle right away and started cutting hay in the subirrigated meadow bottoms. And he also cleared the more level land up on top to establish farm fields and uh, introduce grain production. So this ranch has had cattle, sheep, grain, and hay production throughout its history all the way for 152 years. So, you know, that's, that's how the ranch started. And it passed to the original man's son. Uh, The original gentleman was Richard Hinton, and his son James was born here in the cave a few years later. He took over in 1915, and then later on, a young man who had come to work here in the 1930s was able to become a partner to Jimmy Hinton in 1945, and eventually the Ward family took over from the Hintons. And then George sold the heart of this, what had become an empire of land and livestock holdings, but George sold the heart of it to uh, my husband in 1988, and that's how the Carvers got here. So it's been the Hintons and then the Wards and now Carvers, but it has continually operated with all those production areas throughout its history. Now, you and your husband got really interested in focusing on the health of the land itself, like the ecosystems, the soil and water. How did that come about? Well, that that comes from my husband's upbringing. He grew up in a logging family on the Oregon coast, and his father logged and his grandfather, and 
And my husband uh, began as a young man in that logging. And it just hurt him deeply every time he took down a big tree. And he and his father had spent all their spare time poking around out here in this country in what's thought of as Oregon's outback in this desert interior country. And he loved it. He just he just loved these open spaces and this this semi-arid country. And that was his dream was to ranch in the Oregon desert. But he also, he knew that the healthier the land, the healthier your harvest, and therefore you're healthier for your future. And from the day I ever met him, the thing that he most often would say was that he wanted the earth to win. He always wanted to see the earth win. He loved the wilderness. He loved the land. And that's what really motivated him. So when we had the chance to come here, he immediately reached out to our local natural resource conservation service and soil and water district offices, our agency partners. He wanted their help in analyzing this whole operation, which today is about 50 square miles of deeded land, to look at where our problem areas were and to come up with a plan for a whole system approach that would put the health of natural resources as the focus. And grazing, of course, is a critical tool in the management of these landscapes. And so by 1989, together, they had established a conservation management plan for this operation, which included establishing monitoring sites. And he began implementing that plan in 1989 and 1990. There was another thing that was a big contributor. About the same time that they were completing this plan, our Fish and Wildlife Agency here, who obviously monitors um, species counts on wildlife and fish, had shared that Buck Hollow Creek, which the first 15 miles of Buck Hollow is on us, were the birthplace of two creeks, Bake Oven and Buck Hollow, and shared that only two salmon had returned to spawn in Buck Hollow Creek. Now, Buck Hollow was a major tributary stream to the lower Deschutes River, the Deschutes River is a designated wild and scenic river here in, in Oregon's interior. And when the wildlife age, fish and wildlife reported that only two salmon had returned to a, a stream, which had historically been an incredible salmon fishery, it was a wake up call. It was shocking to the whole region. And it was a great motivator for everyone to collectively come together to look at what we had done to impact this really important indicator species and how could we make a difference? And so working with those agencies and all the landowners in this Buck Hollow Basin, which there's 27 of us together, uh, it spawned a new project. And my husband was a real leader in that. It was called the Buck Hollow Watershed Project. And many years later, that became the model program for what today blankets the state of Oregon. It's called the Oregon Plan. And it blankets the state of Oregon with stakeholder groups for every watershed in the state to work together to restore and protect and heal our streams. So that's really how we got into this work. It was a natural thing to do when you realize that if you have a love of the land, which as far as all the agriculturalists I know, farmers and ranchers, have a passion for the land and for animals, you couldn't do this without that. And if you're always looking, observing, and working to do better, what we have done has been a logical series of things, starting with collaboration with agency partners, establishing monitoring, and analyzing our operations so that we can begin to implement changes that will yield healthier soil, better grasslands, and improved water. Now, the salmon started coming back when you started making changes. Yeah, and I, you know, I want to emphasize it wasn't just us alone. This was kind of a base and approach. But with us being the headwaters, the first 10 years of that project, a lot of work was focused on us. And, you know, there were two parallel strands here on just our ranch with our conservation management plan. We had a number of hopes. We hoped to never use the plow again. We farm about 4,000 acres of dry land, cropland that that young Richard Hinton established with a horse and a plow, if you can imagine. Every field we farm, he created by moving rocks and creating these fields with a horse and a plow. I mean, this is amazing. And we still work that ground. So my husband wanted to eliminate the use of the plow. 
we wanted to never see bare ground. We wanted a good plant cover on all land always. We never again wanted to lose soil to erosion, which happened in dry land farming in the fallow years where you had a crop one year and the next year it was idle. And that was a huge exposure to erosion and invasive species, plants, weeds. So we wanted to reduce that. We wanted to reduce our own use of fossil fuel. How many times you take equipment over the fields? Uh, we didn't ever want to see water run off our land again. We wanted to capture, store, and safely release, as the theory is within our NRCS efforts for so many decades, to capture, store, and safely release water through healthy landscapes, right? And we wanted to see improved forage and improved crop yields. We wanted all the animals, both our livestock and wildlife, to have easier access to water and better water quality. We wanted to use less supplemental feed, none if necessary. 12 months of grazing, the way the creator intended, and no use of supplemental feeds if possible. And we wanted the livestock to be healthier because they were grazing across these landscapes. And we wanted to reduce the opportunities for invader plant species and see improved habitat for fish and wildlife. Another indicator species is we hoped that we would see the beaver return who had once been here. And did you? We did. We did see them and they came from miles and miles back to these habitats, which were now ready, ready for them, right? And so that's what we were looking at internally as our ranch. But with the project, the Buck Hollow project as a group, we talked, you know, and we hope that in our lifetime, we would see the returning salmon increase in numbers in Buck Hollow Creek in our lifetime. But we didn't know if that would happen. You know, my husband began implementing these changes, which I want to emphasize. The first thing that has to happen with this is you have to have a mindset change. And it's that mindset change, which comes through our own observations about what's working. I mean, farmers and ranchers, we're on the ground every day. And, you know, you can tell if things are not improving. You can tell if things are getting worse. You can tell when things are getting better. And those observations are valid, even though they're not measured. And they help set the stage for trying something new. And so we began to see changes after the first year of some of the projects we were implementing. But after 20 years, we witnessed dramatic evidence of land health indicators improving and the return of salmon numbers in a significant way. And honestly, for all of us, it was beyond, it was beyond all our hopes. It was a huge success story. And, and it's that success story of collaborative work across basins, not just one by one, but kind of collectively coordinated with our agency partners, which is what really built the Oregon plan for the state of Oregon. You started doing no-till on your cropland. Tell us a little more about that. Yeah, in fact, these management changes we made in our conservation management plan had two major emphasis. One was the livestock grazing. And so we implemented a number of things to improve the management of grazing and stimulating plant communities, rest and recovery of those plants, how we placed a strategic placement of salt and mineral. And one of the greatest things in the grazing area, besides being able to control the grazing pressure and rotation, was the development of off-stream watering points so that they didn't water out of the natural streams and creeks anymore. This was a really big thing we did. It was very leading. Probably 150 off-stream water developments we put in, which provided water up high for wildlife and our domestic livestock. So that was a major shift. And the other major shift was the no-till farming. So this typical dry land, summer fallow country up here, like I said earlier, you get a crop every year. And then the year that it's fallow, you know, nature does not like bare ground. So in come the plants that can cover the ground and protect it, the soil. And these are invasive weeds typically. So then you have to go over those fields and disc the weeds you have to herald the fields back smooth. Every time you go over the field, you pull up rocks. Now you got to go pick the rocks. And this means driving farm equipment over the fields multiple times in a field in a year that you don't even get a crop. And so by going to no-till, we reduced 
the trips over the field by five, which was a significant decrease in the use of fossil fuel. We reduced our fossil fuel bill in 1996 through this one shift in farming practices by $20,000. I can't imagine what that would be worth today, but it was a big shift. And so we hoped by going to no-till, we would annual crops. We would always have plants in the ground, never a year bare. When we didn't have the growing plant, we would have the, a great standing cover crop. We would graze all of the residue, preparing the soil for seed with livestock, which would naturally spread nutrients through urine and, and manure, as well as, you know, mulch down with their hooves all of that standing residue and put that organic matter in connected into the surface of the soil for further breakdown. We also, by covering the land all the time like that and eliminating those extra trips over the field, reduced our evaporation loss by every time you disturb the soil, you lose moisture. It's like losing an inch of rain or more. So we stopped that and we put all that organic matter into contact with the soil. We eliminated bare ground and exposed soil. We maintained our soil stability with constant standing cover crop. We started building soil rather than losing it. We eliminated the erosion. It was a great and healthy way for livestock to graze those mist dumps, chaff dumps, and the mist seed heads. And they gained weight, very clean. And the land produced more value through not just the crop yield, but the food production by grazing it while improving the land health and the soil health. So we ended up with better soil health and improved water through the decision to park the plow and adopt no-till technology. We had a huge number of positives from that decision back in 96. In 1999, something happened. You've been growing sheep for wool for, as well as meat for a long time. And you had a wool buyer who went way back who stopped buying your wool. What happened? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Life gives us challenges, new challenges. And in agriculture, we face a broad set of changing factors all the time in markets, in regulation, in policy, in climate. We all have to be good observers, good practitioners, but we have to be highly adaptable. So in 1999, we had been selling our wool to the same company for 100 years. We'd been the biggest provider of wool to them in the late 1800s when they started their company and through the first half of the 1900s. So that spring when we shared the wool and called up the buyer who was the face of that company to us, because everything at that time in our life, all harvests sold as commodities, grain, hay, lamb, beef, wool. That's how it typically is in agriculture. And in that way, you're fairly removed from the where it ends up, right? We called the wool buyer and he said, folks, you know, what, what price will we get this year? And he said, folks, I'm really sorry. We're closing our processing here in the region and we're going offshore like everybody else. And we were aware that this was going on, but it had never touched our life before until that day. And that day, it's like it showed up on our doorstep and we had no other options. And in fact, in our region, people were dumping their wool. Nobody knew what to do with it. Wool was out of favor at the time. You know, after World War II in our fashion and textiles, we shifted so hard towards synthetics, oil-based synthetic fabrics. They retrofitted factories to produce our textiles and apparel, and it changed everything. And in our wisdom, we think that we're always inventing something better. But as we in agriculture know, sometimes it takes decades to see the results of decisions that you make and practices that you implement. And so it was a time in the late 90s, actually between 96 and 2000, in just that four-year period in the U.S., 26,000 sheep producers went out of the sheep business, largely due to the offshoring and the loss of textile infrastructure in this country. We have 10% or less of an industry that helped build this country. And, you know, as we remove the ability to feed, clothe, and shelter ourselves, we become more and more dependent on other countries and those outside our borders to provide that for us. And it's a dangerous precedent. I hope as a whole that we hold on 
to the ability to produce our own food and fiber and shelter. We cannot continue moving toward giving that up. So that's what happened. We couldn't sell the wool. And, you know, these local regional systems in both food and textiles have been replaced with global ones. And in doing that, we've created anonymity. We've created a disconnect between the origins of food and fiber and where it comes from, the processes of how it becomes a product and gets to our plate or into our closet. We've been disconnected from the skills that are necessary. Those are timeless skills, timeless. And the people, think of the important people that have the skills to do these things. And that lack of connection has really contributed to the a decrease in the motivation for stewardship. So we wonder why nobody cares about the health of the land anymore. It's because we're so disconnected from where food and fiber come from. And I know it sounds like a cliche today, but we've been living through this journey for 25 years now. So, you know, for all of us, life begins in the soil. And in the end, we return to the soil. And I think it's time we all recognize the importance of this and that we're called to honor it. So my husband gave me a new challenge shortly after that phone call. We had also loss of markets for lamb. There was consolidation in the food sector, and there was one buyer, essentially, commercially, left in all of Western America for lamb. This was the late 90s. This was before so many farmers markets stirred up right? And so we had one buyer for lamb and they were importing heavily. And the price of lamb in the summer of 99 was 50 cents a pound. That's all we could get for lamb. And we could not sell the wool, which is what drove people out of the sheep business. And he said, either we find our own way to sell these harvests or sheep will be gone from the land. So what did you do? Well, you know, when you just look out every day and you live on the land and with these animals, there's something bigger than us. I mean, you can't ignore the fact that we're not what's most important on the planet. And it's really humbling. I mean, we sat here knowing that for 130 years, sheep had been the biggest production focus. Sheep give us meat, wool, skins. You take sheep and add water, it's life to humankind. Wool has been the core of humankind's textiles for more than 10,000 years. The next fiber to become important is like 6,000 years later. How do we tell the creator they don't matter anymore? I was a combination of stunned, lost, and heartbroken, you know? And so he gave me the challenge. And so I set about trying to figure out what to do. How would I get my wool clean and into something saleable? And I began that work. And my husband said a couple of months in, he said, well, if you're going to work on it this hard, work on the meat. That's where the real money is. And so in parallel for the next year, I worked on finding and putting together a supply chain to clean our wool and get it into usable product to put in the market. Same thing, I put together a, a way to get our lamb processed to the specs of local chefs. And one year later, we put our first lamb into restaurants in our region and our yarns initially into stores. And we began telling the story of our heritage and our land production ethic, you know, our sustainability on the land, our progressive agricultural practices, and the fact that we, we were 10 years down the road of bringing salmon home at that point, right? We were seeing amazing changes. So I could share that with a chef or with a yarn store owner and hand them a product, and they were connected. The origin, the process, the people, the story, the truth, the authenticity. And it really resonated with the culture. And we never looked back from that first set of products going into the market. We never looked back. That's how I worked to keep sheep on the land. You then got involved with national brands where your wool was concerned. You started telling that story and got attention that I imagine was sort of beyond your wildest dreams. Beyond my wildest dreams, because I knew nothing. I knew I wasn't a wool expert. I wasn't a knitter. I was a ranch wife in the middle of nowhere. And I didn't know anything about margins, didn't even know the word. I didn't know about marketing, branding, retail, wholesale. I didn't know the supply chain for either the lamb 
or the fiber. But I'm fiercely competitive and I'm really stubborn. <laughs> and I think what I tell people is two things, you know, nobody can make me quit. So I'm really, I'm really stubborn in that way. And the other thing was, is I didn't know that I couldn't do it, right? I didn't know that I couldn't. And so you just begin one step at a time. So once I had my wool converted to yarns, I began, I always worked as close to home as possible. I began as close to home as I could. And I started hiring local fiber artisans that I met to convert my yarns into finished goods. So I had at one point in the early 2000s, about 20, mainly women, but women and men within 120 miles of our ranch who were weaving and spinning and knitting and crochet and felting. And they were converting and I was driving the meat delivery truck and dropping lamb at the back door of the restaurants and eventually our beef and meeting these fiber artisans to pick up yarns. I would pick up what they had knit. I would drop woven panels at the cut and sew and bring home. I mean, I was moving our fiber through the various steps with my meat delivery truck while delivering the lamb and building this fashion brand, right? The, the brands ultimately later would say, Jeannie, where do you manufacture? How did you explain to a designer in New York City that we were manufacturing along a trail of stops in Central Oregon with weavers weaving at home, the fabrics coming back to my kitchen to be finished, then taken to a cut and sew on my meat route and brought back for all the hand stitching of labels and buttons. I mean, this was a, this was a relationship, local, regional, textile effort. And then I would box these boxes of finished goods and ship them to their distribution centers across the country and it would go out to customers. And people didn't realize there was no real factory. There was no real factory. These are timeless skills. What kind of products were you making? Oh, we were making gorgeous scarves and wraps and sweaters and sweater coats and hats and gloves. Not only were we using the shorn wool, the wool fiber, but I was retrieving the skins from the harvesting facilities, our USDA inspected processors who were preparing the lamb into all the beautiful cuts for our chefs in the region. I was bringing the skins home to cure and prepare, having them tanned here in the U.S., and then unable to sell them against the imports as a beautiful tanned skin. I had to add value. Everything we did had to add value to sell it. And so we would cut and sew the skins into gorgeous products, vests, coats, chopper mitts. We uh, bordered woven blankets with the shirling. Beautiful products. And every step we took, Whatever was wasted was repurposed into a new product. As an example, the uh, skin of the market lamb was tanned, and then we would shave most of the wool off here at the ranch. We would cut it first and save the longer cut wool, and that became hand-felted wool fabrics that we then cut and sewed into jackets and felted into scarves and so on. But the short choppy wool that we would shave down to that lamb velvet as we crafted a product would go to the women making the paper out of the short choppy shaved wool. And even the paper became a product so that the lamb whose hide would have been lost or wasted was brought home and preserved and transitioned into a whole line of products. So we had the shorn wool, the meat, and the skin of the lamb. All of that was used with no loss of waste in order to honor the life of that animal. It was an amazing series. It's an amazing, I have an amazing textile archives actually here at the ranch headquarters, our family ranch headquarters. So how did we get to national brands? It took 13 years. I started in 99. We started selling finished goods to a national clothing retailer in 2005. We headlined Portland Fashion Week in 2009 with our Ranch to Runway Story of Oregon Sunlight. Beautiful, beautiful apparel on the runway as the headliner at Portland Fashion Week in 2009. That was what an experience for me. I'd never even been to a fashion show like that. And then in 2012, 
there was a controversy during the London Olympics, if some of you will remember who might be listening, over the Chinese made Olympic uniforms for Team USA. Somebody woke up somewhere and said, why can't we make even our own Team USA uniforms to clothe our Olympic team as they go to compete in the Olympics? And Ralph Lauren is the vendor, provides all the uniforms for Team USA and supports our Olympic team. And they responded to that challenge immediately. It was August of 12 and we were in harvest and we had come in for lunch and there were 15 phone messages on the phone and they were all about my wool marketing by then. I'd been down this road 13 years. I had yarns from our ranch with our ranch name in hundreds of stores across America for people to buy the yarns and knit the pattern and make their own things from our yarn, besides the finished goods we were doing. And one of those phone messages was a gentleman I called back. And when I asked him which yarn store he was with, he said, I'm not with a store yarn store. I'm with product development for Polo Ralph Lauren in New York. And I was stunned, you know, this was like the second call that would change our life. The first one was when we called our wool buyer for 100 years and they said, we're not buying. 13 years later, this call truly did change our life. He told me that they were looking for an American yarn and they had found me. So I had penetrated the markets that far that when they were researching American yarns, they found us. And our ranch name is Imperial Stock Ranch. And I was marketing essentially under that name. And I sold my heart out that day to him. I told the story. Uh, the next day I sent samples of our yarns and he called me every day for a month. A month later, they sent a design team. And when they got on site, we did what we did, we're doing with all the visitors. We've toured thousands of people here by appointment. They wanna come to where the lamb comes from, to where the wool comes from. They wanna reconnect, not just, you know, we used to think they were connecting with our history. You know what happens when people come here and walk through our historic headquarters and you hear the story and see the dogs and the sheep and the horses and the people, they connect with their own histories because we all have this history several generations back, right? Everybody's grandmother used to raise chickens, right? And so people connect with their own history when they come to see us. But anyway, when they got here, this design team, we never looked at yarns for hours. We started on the land. We told the story of stewardship of natural resources. We showed them the conversion to no-till. We showed them off-stream watering and, and rotational grazing and the purpose of grazing animals to bite and stimulate plant communities. We showed them through our story of returning salmon to our creeks. Then we took them on a walking tour through our historic headquarters. All the main buildings here of 22 acres of grounds and buildings, the main agricultural buildings were all built before industrialization. They were built during the days of horsepower and we're still using these facilities. It's a wonderful walking tour. You would just walk through time, right? And then we fed them. We had a wonderful lunch and it was all food from here. And when finally we had done that, which was really grounding them in what's important, grazing animals, soil, plants, water, and life to humankind. That's what's important. When we had done that, then I took them to the historic Hinton house next door to where I'm sitting right now, which houses my archives and at the time housed this value added textile business, which was going nuts. And we started looking at the yarns and they were clutching these skeins of yarn that I was selling to the hand knit market. I was selling to all the people like are listening today who knit their own hats and sweaters and gloves and socks for their families. They were clutching these yarns and I thought, wow, maybe this could be possible, maybe. And so uh, six months later, we got the largest yarn order of my life up until then for a project which ultimately became the Team USA uniforms, their first ever made in America Olympic uniforms for Team USA for the Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia in 2014. Not only did they purchase the yarn. They see a brand like that. Nobody was listening to me. Nobody was listening to me. I was a voice from the wilderness. I was a, an unknown ranch wife. You know, that crazy wool lady out there, you know, who's always talking about the wool. 
who are you going to get to listen to you when everybody's offshore making things? But Ralph Lauren had the power to influence others. And they worked with 41 companies for those uniforms in 2014. And they chose to tell our story. So they sent a film team here and they captured our story and they told the world that story. And that changed our life. They had the power to influence others. So for all of us that are involved in value-added marketing, when our partners, our customer partners, you know, tell our story proudly because they need us and we need them, right? When that happens, they influence others to become customers, consume that harvest and make all of us stronger. And all of us become partners in the work on the land, the stewardship of natural resources. They become an investor with us. And so when they told the world, the brands kept coming. And that is how we got involved with all these other brands, you know, many, many other brands in apparel, accessories, hosiery, and home fashions. We were working across all categories after 2015. So did you stop doing the other business that you were doing with the finished products? No, not really. <laughs> I um, I was selling yarn into stores, lots of yarn. That's a whole market channel. And that yarn had to have full support. I hired designers to do all of the designs, create the patterns, all the technical reviews. We went to trade shows. We worked with the media in that industry. The craft industry in this country, we were immersed in that. Okay, that's one market sector. But I also was at trade shows selling finished goods. I was also at trade shows selling our own home fashions with our own label on them. And I was partnering with other brands to do co-branded home fashions, co-branded apparel. And I was private labeling for some companies who never revealed really where it came from, but we produced and delivered the product for them with their brand on it. It was a pretty complex business. By the end of 2015, ultimately, I sold that business. I don't know if you knew that. My husband had developed an incurable degenerative disease, and it became really important for me to pull back and focus really close to home. And ultimately, uh, by 2016, I was his full-time caregiver until he passed away. But I had built that value-added fiber business up to that level. You're listening to Down to Earth. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're in a new chapter of conservation. In the first chapter of conservation in this country, you had wilderness and then you had city. But today, more and more, we understand that there's this very important piece in the middle that we call the working landscape. That is Leslie Allison the executive director of the Western Landowners Alliance. These are the places that provide our food, our fiber. They provide the jobs that sustain the rural communities. These things are incredibly important and they're disappearing. And that's really our next challenge going forward. We have to think beyond protected wilderness. And you can't do that unless you're engaging the people in those landscapes, first and foremost, in that solution. Led by the people on the ground, Western Landowners Alliance advances policies and practices that sustain working lands, connected landscapes, and native species. What we're seeing in the West today is incredibly hopeful because you do see collaborations, working with partners, trying to realize this vision that's so important to us. I think many places in the rural West are actually leading the way on this. And so can you. Join us and learn more at westernlandowners.org. This year's Regenerate Conference will be held in Santa Fe, New Mexico, November 1st through 3rd. It will explore regenerative agriculture at every scale, from microbial soil communities to social relationships and markets to our changing climate and everything in between. Come learn how people from all walks of life are innovating on the land, in the markets, and with their communities to bring greater diversity and resilience to this movement. Early bird prices and September 15th, Check out the website for more information at regenerateconference.com. And now back to our program. Tell us about the development of something called the Responsible Wool Standard. 
Yeah, an interesting thing, an interesting thing happened following the Olympic notoriety, many brands coming. One of the brands that called on me in early 2015 was a well-known brand in the outdoor recreation sector named Patagonia. And I'm sure many people are familiar with Patagonia. They're considered a very green clothing company. And they reached out to me because there had been some issues in their wool supply in South America with animal abuse. And they were stepping back and rethinking because imagine as agriculturalists, imagine a fashion brand or an apparel or textile brand that is trying to be responsible and yet agriculture is not their field. How would they possibly know all the questions to ask? And so when this incident happened, they were very, very, it really cut them deeply, you know, and they wanted to step back and really do the right thing. And they were involved at, at that time, along with a whole lot of brands and other stakeholders, nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy um, that deal with land care, nonprofits in the animal welfare area like Four Paws. They were all collectively working together with textile manufacturers, an organization called Textile Exchange. It's a nonprofit, it's a global organization headquartered in Texas who exists to improve the sustainability of the textile and fashion industry. The textile and fashion industry is a very polluting industry. It does a lot of damage to the planet. And they are really working hard to make changes in that industry. So collectively, these people were working to develop a set of criteria, benchmarks for land care and animal welfare, best practices, a global standard, which is today has become the leading standard in the world for sheep and wool production. So Patagonia was one of the leading brands driving to have this standard built. And they told us when they reached out that they would need us to be third party audited for our land stewardship and our animal husbandry. And when we looked at the draft of the standard, we said, we already believe in these things and do these things. We have no problem doing that. So when that standard launched in 2016, our family ranch, Imperial Stock Ranch, became the first sheep production ranch in the world certified to the RWS, the Responsible Wool Standard. So now I step back to where I told you I sold off my business to become my husband's caregiver and it put me on the sidelines, but our ranch was certified. And now all of a sudden, brand after brand started coming wanting RWS certified wool because it helps them de-risk their involvement with land degradation, with animal abuse, with poor worker conditions, which are all part of the RWS. So there is a growing demand for RWS certified wool in America by fashion and textile brands. So I was on the sidelines, but my husband and I thought about it and talked about it. And I said, Dan, why don't we do this differently? I'm not gonna make a yarn. I'm not gonna make a product. If we can find other ranches to join us, why don't we start a new business that's beyond our ranch and just bring a supply of wool in, produced in the United States that meets this leading global standard? That is when, in 2018, I launched Shanico Wool Company. It was to scale the supply of U.S. produced wool that meets the RWS. So today we are 10 ranches in the Western U.S., we collectively graze 2.6 million acres, and we shear about a half a million pounds of beautiful merino and merino cross wool each year. And that's how I got involved with the RWS, and I have remained so. And I'm a global poster child for the RWS because I think it's an incredible standard. It's comprehensive. It was built by a broad group of stakeholders. So it's a third party standard that's third party audited each year to more than 270 benchmarks we must meet in land care, animal welfare and worker welfare to be certified. So it ensures full traceability and it really helps bring confidence to the consumer and to brands. One of the things that you're doing 
is you work with scientists to really take measurements and demonstrate how your land is doing in terms of carbon sequestration and ecosystem health. What led to that and what is what does that look like? Well, that is a great question. Again, I never planned any of this. I want you and your listeners to hear me. I never planned any of this, right? Not one thing. All of this is logical next steps from the day that we wanted to see the earth win here at home on our ranch. All that we did under our conservation management plan, the evolution to our value added because of the inability to sell our harvest. We were forced down this road. And then the certification, because as we continue to connect with brand partners and consumers, this is what the consumer today is demanding. And the brands, we want products that are produced in a way that's positive to nature. So every step has been logical for us. Every step is built on what was before. In 2019, in the winter, there was increasing concern by brands in the fashion sector over the ecosystem and climate impacts of the fibers they source. Not just the people where they manufacture and what they're doing with wastewater and dyes and chemicals and working conditions, but we have a tremendous opportunity at the source of fibers, us in agriculture, to impact the environment through how we ranch. And so we are getting more and more people targeting the way we ranch to ensure that we are doing so in a responsible way. And so a brand challenged me straight out that winter about whether or not we were destroying the soil and polluting the atmosphere with methane by raising livestock. And you know, it's really a kick in the gut when up to now we've had our observations, which have been pretty good, agency testimony, yield data, species counts, where we were returning salmon in record numbers, and now third-party certification by a global credible certification body that we're meeting these 270 criteria. And somebody in a cubicle in the city says, are you destroying the earth? Who is way removed from agriculture. It's hard for us to hear that. It's hurtful, but it it fired me up. (laughs) So you know what I realized that day? I realized that none of these other things would be good enough for some people. It was time to measure. Could we measure the results of our ranching operations on an annual basis. What was our net impact? We all earn money every year and we all spend money. At the end of the day, from our financial health, did we add to our debt load this year or did we gain a little ground? Did we put money in the bank? What's our balance from an environmental perspective? So I was asking around trying to find someone who could help me. And I found Dr. John Talbot from Oregon State University who has spent a lifetime in ranching and agriculture. He was raised in Wyoming. His academic field is range science. He was actually worked for the US Department of Energy to create and deploy carbon capture technologies. He has had a lifetime of work in agriculture, grazing and carbon capture and the collateral benefits of improved carbon capture. And so I said, John, can we determine the the net impacts of our ranching operation? He said, yes, we can. I said, and at the end of the day, if we are banking a positive environmental value, would that ever have value? He said, absolutely it will in these emerging ecosystem markets. And I said that I wanna build a program, a model to measure our ranch in Oregon But I also want to measure all of the core members right now of Shanika Wool Company. I want to measure the whole 2.6 million acres. I want every ranch of the 10 to know what our net balance is. And therefore, we'll know what the aggregate impact of our Shanika Wool supply is for these brands who care and want to know. This is where we need to go today. And so John developed a model that would withstand all challenges. And we began measuring in the spring of 2020. Today, we're in our fourth year. We have three and a half years of data on our Oregon ranch. I have two years of data on one and a half million acres, and we've baselined the other million. We are using peer review and third-party certification for the findings of our research project. I won't say it's cheap. It has been an investment, but I will tell you today, Our Oregon ranch is 32,000 acres of deeded land. 
Every year for 152 years, we have delivered harvests of beef, lamb, wool, grain, and hay to market in a dry land environment that sees less than eight inches of rain a year. But I think the greatest deliverable we make up to now we had never measured. And today we know what that is. In each of the last three years, in a drought cycle, we have on a net basis put an additional 60,000 tons of carbon into our soils and grazing lands each of the last three years, which means we've drawn down more than 218,000 tons of CO2, just this one ranch, and our greenhouse gas emissions values, net value is a negative number. So yes, our livestock emit methane, and yes, we use some fossil fuels, and yes, we lose electricity and some synthetic fertilizer. But when you look at the collective action of our management and practices inclusive of our farming practices and our livestock grazing, our net impact is positive to nature. That ecosystem deliverable is probably the greatest thing we do that no one knows we do. And the only way we can ever claim that was to measure it, verify it, and prove it. And I'm happy to say that John was right because we're in our second year of a contract for that new commodity, that ecosystem deliverable that we are bringing. So it's a brand new income stream. And my goal today, my hope for the future, is my goal is to bring every rancher in my group a new income stream through a net positive nature value while we're bringing food, clothing, shelter to the human community also. So that income stream is based on ecosystem services and ultimately in carbon credits or carbon offsets. Tell us about that. Well, I really didn't know how this would all work. I just had a hope, you know. I dared to dream on this one. On all the rest of it, I didn't. I spent no time dreaming. I kept my head down and I did the work in front of me. And I went down a twisty trail sometimes, but I was going to get it done and deliver it. And so far, we've been able to do that successfully and keep it financially, you know, make its way, these value-added marketing efforts. But on this one, I was so new and I was so unsure. But in February of 22, we actually got in contact. With, I don't even know how, I'm not sure how I remember. We ended up connected to one of these ecosystem services companies that work in the voluntary markets who met me and we set up our first Zoom and we began talking. And I will tell you that we have been working with that company since February of 2022. The first thing they did was they were amazed that I had a group of ranchers who not only who managed in a similar way, even though each of us is unique because of our different locations and situations, but we had common benchmarks to meet in soil health and water and pesticides and nutrient management and grazing and so on, because we were all part of the RWS program. We were all certified at the RWS. Second, I knew what carbon capture was about and I was actually working on it. And third, we had a measurement initiative underway for two and a half years already. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. And so then they put their science team with my OSU science team, which is multiple PhDs in range science and soil science now that we work with. It's a great and very strong team. And they vetted that team for about seven months, including visits to Oregon State's laboratories to look at our data and the analysis of the laboratories and our findings. And I will say that in the end, see, this is a company that's been working in Europe for a long time who already sells quality carbon credits into markets and they do that based on their measurement model but we were told that our measurement model actually surpasses theirs so they said genie keep executing your research model and so we are the second thing was they took our project upline to the registry and had us approved so that shanical wool company is an approved project to bring high quality carbon credits to market now, I've also learned in recent months, well, in the last year, that you can sell offsets or you can sell insets. That's not really my expertise, just as I'm not a wool expert, nor am I a scientist. I'm just a hard worker bee, you know. But 
what companies like the fashion brands that work with us, they really want to move their companies toward net zero to their corporate sustainability targets. So they don't just want to buy a carbon offset to offset their negative footprint. They want to invest with us in an inset that that investment, when they purchase that carbon credit, it moves their company toward their net zero targets. And the dollars they spend on that additionally, besides the purchase of a harvest, those dollars spent through these companies that bring the framework, the credibility, and all the oversight, that money, that new income stream to us is guaranteed a portion of those dollars in these new ecosystem contracts. You must spend that money, portions of those monies, right back on the natural resources where you're building the, the carbon. So it's a guaranteed investment in improved performance of the land. It makes all of them the voluntary ecosystem company, the companies who purchase the insets, they become new stakeholders in our work on the ground as ranchers in regenerative agriculture. That's our income stream. I mean, we all already work with our NRCS offices, soil and water district, RCNT. We're involved in cost share programs. We're always trying to do better. This is an evolving arena that is making us even stronger and reconnecting. Remember I said earlier, these global supply chains destroyed the connection of our local and regional food and textile supply chains. Well, this is a way we reconnect them. When they come home and invest in us, they're now a partner in our work on the ground with trying to deliver and working to deliver positive environmental impacts reducing our GHG emissions, avoiding emissions, improving our carbon capture, improving water, biodiversity. These are all things that our corporate companies that are our partners care about today. So this is a framework and a model which connects us all back together to know where your product came from and to allow all of us to work to be even stronger in investing in improved environmental and climate performance. I'm so excited. This is the greatest work I have ever done. My only regret today is that my husband did not live to see the results of this measurement initiative, the Shanical Wool Carbon Initiative, because it, it, it's ground truths, everything he believed. It's the only proof of whether or not you are really regenerative. Otherwise, it's just another word. We're gonna do some things, but when you measure it, verify it and certify it with all these oversights, it's the only proof of being able to say that we're regenerative. You've, as you said, expanded onto multiple ranches, and some of that is grazing actually on public land. Are public agencies open to the kind of regenerative ranching that you're doing? I think all of us that care about land stewardship are open to what we're calling regenerative ranching today. I don't know any range conservationist that isn't invested in all of us helping to do a better job. I mean, that's what we've been doing for forever. So all of the ranches that already work with federal agencies cooperatively each year on their annual operating instructions, when we're gonna start grazing, how many animals, when we're gonna come off, how we're gonna enter the allotment, how we're gonna move through the allotment, which areas we're gonna avoid because of this issue or that issue. We all work cooperatively with all kinds of agencies, federal, land agencies, fish and wildlife agencies, state agencies. If you think about collectively how many threatened or endangered species are just dealt with within our 10 ranch farm group, we're talking about grizzly bears, wolves, spotted frogs, butterflies, cutthroat trout, sage grouse, I, I mean, it's on and on and on. We are collaborative, we are cooperative, we are paying attention, and we are working with those range conservationists and specialists within our agencies, yes, to look at how can we continue to do an ever better job. What's beautiful about this project is we never started measuring. We got permission before we ever started doing our data collection. 
I would never have gone out without the permission. So we went to every local field office and forest service office within which we all graze. We worked with each local ranger district and field office with those conservationists, telling them what our project was, sharing the model with them, telling them what data we're going to collect, which is a very, un, and there's no impact because it's a very uninvasive way to collect data. And so we are collecting soil samples. It's a two inch auger. No one would ever know you collected the soil. And uh, we're also doing a biomass clipping and we are doing moisture probing. And then we're using leading computer models. But we got permission to do those testing with the acknowledgement that we are willing to share data. We have the most comprehensive research project going on out there across a large chunk of the West of anyone that we're aware of. And the agency partners are very excited to show what our summary data is going to tell across these multiple national forests and BLM districts. So I find that they have been very supportive. It's sometimes slow to get permissions because they've got to work up line. So more than anything, my only frustration is the time that it takes to get to the people that can give you permission or to the people that really need to see the data as we begin to collaborate on how we want to make some changes on management and practices. But all in all, we're, we're all in this together because here's why. All of this is a new income stream is predicated on improved land performance. So if there is no improved land performance, ecosystem performance, there's no income stream. That's the bottom line. So the only way you will create that is through improved land performance. Who doesn't want that? If we are doing that, if there's any money changing hands, then the land is winning, which means the farmer and rancher, the livestock operator is winning, the agency partners are winning, every citizen of the planet is winning because that's the only way that you get that income. It seems like so much of what you're doing is building relationships. And I kind of see the network of your relationships that you're in as being kind of parallel to the network of relationships that are going on in the biotic community, you know. And one of the things that you talked about when we were chatting the other day was this work is bridging a rural-urban divide through the relationships that you that you are necessarily building. You're right. I think the way I guess I would say it is I used to feel, you know, we're a long way from town and we're a long way from the west side of Oregon and Portland. I used to feel really different from the folks that lived in Portland. I used to feel like we think differently and we vote, probably vote differently. And what you were focused on was how different you are. But the day that I began delivering lamb to the back door of the kitchens in Portland or any of the other larger cities we go to, the day I started delivering lamb to the back door of the kitchen was the day that began to change because I needed those guys. When I delivered boxes of yarn to the yarn store in Portland, all of that starts to change. That's the day you realize you, get, you start talking to each other. You get to know each other. You start to find your common ground. And the biggest thing is I realized that I need you. I need them. If I don't have them, we're out of business. And guess what? They need us. So all of a sudden, we have conversations. We share perspectives. And we realize we have more in common than we do different. And that's when the urban-rural divide disappears. And all of a sudden, they became family. They were part of the ranch family. So I'm connected to them in a way I never was before. And if we hadn't been forced to go to direct marketing, I don't know that that would have changed. It's more than city and country. It's more than the east and west of Oregon for me. Or the western slope in Denver and Colorado, and you repeat that all over the place. It changed something else. It reconnected that supply chain. The guys washing and combing the wool, spinning yarn, dyeing it, knitting products inside factoring, cutting and sewing finished goods. When you stop and think about the guys in these factories, how many ranchers have they ever talked to? Do they know where the fiber even comes from? Do they care what happened at the ground? Is there any identity here? 
Do we know who they are or care about them? See, we were all completely broken from each other, broken, which means that takes away from something really important, don't you think? A community that starts close to home and it ripples further out. It has to do with local community, family pride, community pride, state pride, regional, and country. And truthfully, the human community at, one, at some point, because we are all on this planet together. So I want to say that I also was not connected to the Eastern United States at all. Didn't pay attention to what happened there. The Southeast, the Northeast, the Middle, Southern California. They weren't in my world. You know what? I care about those guys. I got their home cell phone numbers. I talk to them at home. I go visit them. We go to eat. I care about the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the floods and what's happening because I'm now connected to the guys from Massachusetts to South Carolina, to Chicago or St. Louis, to Los Angeles, we are all connected. And that's what Ralph Lauren did way back in 14. They connected every one of us to our own U.S. Olympic team in a way we would never have been. That is a phenomenal thing. That makes us all stronger. What are your hopes and plans for the future? I mean, you've been at this a long time. What about the next generation? Well, there's a book written on the history of Wasco County, Oregon by William McNeil, and it says, post offices may come and post offices may go, but the Imperial Stock Ranch will go on forever. So I've always loved that quote. So we are here every day reminded of the history of those before us. You know, they're all family to me. Just like all the people I've been talking about in this whole talk today have become part of our family. I care about them and we care about each other. My husband did pass away in the summer of 2021, two years ago. And as he passed away, our family ranches moved into the next generation. We have three children and they're all shared ownership in our agricultural lands, these ranches. And the oldest son is carrying on the business of running the agricultural livestock and farming operation. His name is Blaine Carver, and he is he's cut out for it. He's carrying on in the same way the first man that arrived here, you know. And so our future is secure. And then my youngest son is actually working with me and Shanico Wool Company, and he's now leading this carbon initiative for me and articulating with the certification bodies globally for us as we find a way to remain competitive. This is an important point. America has to remain competitive. This RWS standard, you could see all the major wool producing countries of the world moving on this. Back in 16 and 17, you could see Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and South America. America has to remain competitive with the changing circumstances and demands in our markets. And today, Shanico Wool Company is still the only group of ranches in the United States certified to the RWS. And so our youngest son will be positioned to keep carrying us on in this marketing as well as his brother on the ranching. So we're secure for the future and I'm, I'm really proud of all of them. Jeannie Carver is founder and president of Shanico Wool Company and she will be speaking at the Regenerate Conference in Santa Fe in November. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. I'm very privileged to have been invited. Thank you. And if you want to find out more, you can go to shanicowoolcompany.com. Shanico is spelled S-H-A-N-I-K-O. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. 
And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.